view. And now? No. Oh, I don't know why I wouldn't have audio here. I'm not muted now. Go ahead and get started. It looks like other people can hear Dr. Friedland, but I can't. And that's not clear to me. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. I even logged on like 20 minutes ago to check on this, but since there was no one else there, I couldn't check my audio or other people's audio against mine. So um, Just let me ahead. quickly. I can... uh, oh, okay, I'll go ahead and start then. All right, yeah. And, and so I have the chat window up. Yes. Uh, so feel free to, uh, if somebody has questions or um, uh, something's going on, just uh, put it in the chat window and I'll try to be, I'll try to be responsive. <clears throat> um, okay, so I'm Randy Brown. I am uh, one of the PGY4s in neurology and this is my uh, Grand Rounds uh, presentation. I will, I'd like to get started with a case. So case is a, um, this is about a patient who's a 63 year old right-handed female who developed intractable nausea, vomiting, and hiccups that had been going on for two weeks. Um, she was evaluated by our gastroenterologist and this was unrevealing. Um, at the hospital, an MRI was performed that showed an enhancing lesion in the dorsal medulla, and a lumbar puncture was performed that showed um, 55 um, cells, uh, white blood cells, uh, and a protein of 50 with negative illegal clonal bands. And here is a picture of the MRI with an arrow sign at the dorsal medulla um, or the area postrema. So she was treated with IV steroids and um, subsequently developed a myelitis. And um, so a repeat MRI was performed. And in this case, again, um, there are, so on the right is a post-contrast image, the left is the flare. Um, there are two lesions in the medulla or the, and near the cervical spine. So um, the myelitis was followed by episodic painful spasms in her right arm, which responded well to carbamazepine and um, serum aquaporin 4 IgG was positive. Um, and so she was diagnosed with aquaporin 4 um, IgG seropositive neuromyelitis optica, which is the topic of my, of my talk today. So um, we'll kind of come back to that patient and some of her her presenting signs and, and as well as the management of, of, of that attack. Um, so what I'm hoping to cover today is briefly defining NMO, uh, touching on the history as well as the epidemiology, the pathophysiology, a little bit of pathology, um, as well as the typical features and course of neuromyelitis optica. Um, the diagnosis of NMO and the management of acute NMO as well as the long-term management of the disorder. So neuromyelitis optica, uh, even in, in medical school, I'd heard also called by its eponym, Devic's disease. It is a multifocal CNS demyelinating disorder um, that is associated particularly with three core uh, clinical um, diseases or, or um, syndrome um, uh, issues. And, and that's kind of what I want to hammer home as far as things that should make somebody think of or consider neuromyelitis optica, which would be optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, or area postrema syndrome. And these aren't the exclusive, but they are the probably the most important presenting features of this disorder. Um, called Devix disease uh, after a report from Devic in 1894. Um, on the left is his abstract. And uh, I don't speak French, but um, his, but I'll just kind of talk about it briefly, his, uh, one of his medical students, Galt, um, uh, in his graduating thesis, uh, described a patient who passed away from a, a simultaneous transverse myelitis and optic neuritis. 
Um, there are accounts from physicians and reports earlier in the 1800s of patients with simultaneous, what was described as acute amaurosis and uh, cervical myelitis, and some of whom had a complete recovery. And there were also reports of patients with uh, partly reversible tetraparesis as well as bilateral amaurosis. So there's descriptions in the literature of patients with similar or um, disorders compelling for what we call neuromyelitis optica now. Um, and that's, uh, but, but the first to describe it using the term neuromyelitis optica would have been uh, Devic and as well as Gulp. So to touch on the, the pathology of it, um, it, until about 2004, it was considered a variant of multiple sclerosis until the discovery of NMOIgG. Further work uh, showed that the NMOIgG actually targeted aquaporin-4, targeted aquaporin-4. Um, aquaporin-4 is a water channel protein that's integral to the astrocytic plasma cell membranes. So what I have here on the right side of the screen is immunofluorescence showing co-localization with aquaporin-4. This is in mouse tissues, but this is in the 2005 paper um, where A, or this top row, uh, shows in mouse brain around burkow robin space at the PL astrocyte interface um, in the cerebellar cortex and the midbrain. So um, the NMO antigen is green and um, the aquaporin-4 channel protein is in red. And so on the far right side, you're seeing the merged images in the top row. The second row and the third row each show kidney and stomach tissue. Um, aquaporin-4 is highly concentrated in foot process domains facing microvessels, and it is the predominant water channel in the central nervous system. It plays a role in brain edema after focal cerebral ischemia, as well as in the edema with CNS neopl neoplasm and in water intoxication. As far as the pathogenesis is concerned, this is kind of a busy diagram, but I wanted to focus, or I'm kind of a visual person myself, and um, what I want to uh, point out, so on the left side are um, aquaporin-4 IgG that are produced. I don't know if you can see my cursor necessarily. Sometimes people can. Um, on the left side is aquaporin-4 antibody production um, by plasma cells and plasma blasts. This is mainly, oops, um, mainly in the periphery and um, these penetrate the CNS through endothelial transcytosis or regions where there is blood relative blood-brain barrier permeability or injury. So the anatomy here uh, is very important. Um, so the binding of IgG to aquaporin-4 on the surface of astrocytes in the middle of the figure induces an inflammatory reactive stress response. And so the consequences of this are many, um, one of which is translational and transcriptional events and early recruitment of granulocytes in the CNS, and this triggers an immune response. Um, the binding can also interfere with this water channel function where aquaporin-4 can be internalized and degraded. Um, this doesn't always lead to astrocyte destruction, um, but it, it can also. Um, so the mechanisms that cause the astrocyte injury include antibody-dependent cellular toxicity, um, mostly mediated by natural killer cells, as well as complement-dependent cytotoxicity. Um, and so these mechanisms uh, make the inflammation significantly worse and contribute to the to injury of cells, as well as demyelination, neuronal loss, oligodendrocyte injury. And I'll, I'm going to visit this figure again because it's important and, and kind of the purpose of this figure is to help describe various therapies um, for neuromyelitis optica. Um, like I said, as far as the outcome, some of the other ones that are, contribute to the disease process also include uh, downregulation of excitatory amino acid transporter with glutamate and resultant glutamate excitotoxicity. 
and complement dependent and antibody dependent cellular toxicity. Um, so um, aquaporin for immunostaining, as I mentioned, they can be internalized or cause damage of those uh, uh, membrane proteins. Um, is law aquaporin for immunostaining is lost and cortical lesions are not typically found, which is one distinguishing factor from N of NMO from NMO from N multiple sclerosis, where aquaporin for immunostaining is typically preserved or, and um, cortical lesions are common. And throughout the talk, I'll kind of be making references to some of the other similar pathologies or demyelinating disorders, including multiple sclerosis and uh, MOG. So on a more macroscopic level, um, I know there's a number of sections here, but I want to show just how devastating the lesions can be. Um, these are spinal cord cross sections that show the extensive involvement and demyelination in the gray and white matter. There is macrophage uh, microglia infiltration uh, present in figure B, um, and axonal loss is demonstrated in the center. Again, I'm using my cursor, um, but it's in the middle, basically, where you see that triangle shape uh, medially and extending laterally along, I guess, what would be the patient's right side if, if this section is oriented in the same way. Um, there is also a, a vasculocentric pattern of complement activation and eosinophil and neutrophil infiltration. So um, again, just really kind of trying to cover or hammer home that there's extensive demyelination. This involves both the gray and the white matter. Um, hang on, I lost my chat window, there we go, okay. Uh, gray and the white matter um, with 60% of all spinal cord NMO lesions occupying more than half of the spinal cord cross section. A little bit more pathology, the point of which is to show how there is the top two, the top row is showing perivascular inflammation and tissue destruction in H and E staining. There are lymph and B, the right hand side, there's lymphocytes and perivascular cinephils. Uh, that's what the arrows are, are demonstrating. Um, with um, and then in C, uh, the stain is trying to show. Uh, complement deposition, which again will be relevant when we start to talk about the uh, therapies for neuromyelitis optica. Um, and then finally in E, what I wanted to, what I'm trying to point out is macrophage infiltration and microglial activation um, with a CD68 or macrophage staining uh, immunohistochemistry. Uh, Again, just really trying to, to demonstrate that there's a number of ways that neuromyelitis optica attacks the central nervous system and these various targets lend themselves to the therapies that I'll be discussing later in this paper. So the epidemiology, approximately three or four in 100,000 in the United States and Denmark and in Japan are, are approximately this, about the same across these different countries, um, but a dramatic increase or difference in populations of African descent uh, up to 10 and 100,000, and it is five to 10 times more common in females than males. Importantly, the age distribution is, is really across the spectrum. Uh, the median age at onset in multiple sclerosis, for example, also any, but more towards the third decade. In NMO, uh, the fourth decade tends to be uh, where this can, the median age of onset is. Um, as far as the gender, uh, I'm sorry, the sex, the biological sex, multiple sclerosis is a two to one uh, female to male, uh, while neuromyelitis optica is nine to one. Um, and then MOG as a contrast is about one and a half to one. Um, as far as the ethnicity is concerned, when it comes to multiple sclerosis, um, the white whites are more predisposed, um, whereas in NMO, as I mentioned, there's a, about a uh, there's a several fold or two fold or so uh, increase in African populations of African descent. Um, the geography is also kind of is, is also interesting in terms of its distribution, where multiple sclerosis is more common in regions farthest from the equator, where NMO uh, is a higher represents a higher proportion of the demyelinating disease. Um, we see as aquaporin for IgG positive, where MS prevalence is low. Um, MOG's distri gen uh, geographic distribution is not as well understood. 
So there are a number of comorbidities, uh, autoimmune comorbidities with neuromyelitis optica, things to keep in mind. Um, uh, lupus, Sjogren's disease, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And then in blue, I have pathologies or diseases, disorders that are not associated with CNS pathology, like autoimmune thyroiditis and myasthenia gravis. Um, the why about this is less clear right now. Some people um, or rather some theorize that systemic inflammatory issue uh, factors like autoantibodies or other inflammatory mechanisms can tr uh, disrupt the blood brain barrier. And, um, you know, this is a critical uh, component of the pathology of NMO. And so if you have a CNS active uh, autoimmune disorder, uh, you've opened the door to other uh, autoantibodies or other autoimmune issues in the same way. And again, that's just one of a few different possibilities why these disorders might be comorbid. So the, the three features that I want to hammer home, again, are transverse myelitis, optic neuritis, and area postrema syndrome. These are the core clinical features. There are other, um, and then as far as the clinical features or presentation, it's typically relapsing and uh, the deficits tend to be very severe and permanent. Um, the other features of NMO, though, vary and can include um, uh, essentially systems affected like the hypothalamus, the brainstem, so patients can manifest with issues like narcolepsy, SIADH has been reported with, along with other hypothalamic presentations like anorexia. Um, acute myopathy uh, has been reported as well with hyperCKemia, um, and there are also brainstem syndromes, which include ophthalmoplegia, hearing loss, opsoclonus, myoclonus, um, encephalopathy is also a presentation including uh, irreversible encephalopathy syndrome or an unaided like picture. Um, hydrocephalus, uh, and then an important uh, feature that I feel like kind of overlaps a little bit with what we can see with multiple sclerosis, which is cognitive dysfunction, uh, including subcortical sub type uh, inattention, executive dysfunction, reduced speed of processing, uh, which I didn't read necessarily described as a fog, but what I closely associate with, you know, the f sort of brain fog described by patients with multiple sclerosis. So transverse myelitis, um, I've obviously, I've chosen to show some fairly dramatic images. This can be fairly typical appearing with numbness, uh, symptoms of numbness, weakness, and bowel or bladder impairment and Lermit's phenomenon. The figure shows a, is a 60 year old male with, uh, who presented with subacute weakness and numbness in his lower extremities, uh, as well as a neurogenic bladder. Uh, the figure on the right shows um, uh, significant uh, again, I'll try to get my mouse cursor over it, but where A shows a, an extensive lesion. In fact, so these are all the same patient. They're just slightly rotated images, sagittal plane, MRI. Um, there's an extensive lesion starting in the cervical spine and extending distally. Um, in this case, uh, the cervical and thoracic spine showed uh, from C3 to the conus, uh, this particular patient was affected. So the optic neuritis and, and transverse myelitis patient, I'm sorry, in neuromyelitis and NMO patients is often very severe and it is also often bilateral. And um, the distinguishing features that we can use up against uh, multiple sclerosis or other autoimmune optic neuritis syndromes is that it's frequently posterior and often involves the chiasm. So in this figure I'm showing, uh, this is a contrast T1 uh, coronal on an NMO patient in the bright white, sort of like the eyes on a frowny face, are showing the optic nerve uh, enhancement in an affected a patient with optic neuritis. Um, so as I mentioned, it's more severe in comparison to multiple sclerosis and the recovery is less complete. Um, it's um, the longer term changes in these patients with optic neuritis, the over time, they tend to have a greater thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer on o measured on OCT. And one more slide on optic neuritis because I'm doing our ophthalmology. I couldn't help, couldn't be helped. Um, is um, just another uh, an axial section uh, demonstrating that 
uh, an example of enhancement. This enhancement is often more than half the length of the optic nerve in some of these cases. And um, again, this is more of an anterior optic nerve involvement, but it is again bilateral. Importantly, it, when optic neuritis is a presenting or disease-defining attack, there is often a lag, um, and the lag between the initial optic neuritis and the disease-defining attack is around two, is typically around two years. Um, so Aeroposterima syndrome, focusing on the box in the red, this is described as intractable nausea and vomiting with or without hiccups, where A is a sagittal post-contrast T1 MRI that demonstrates an enhancing lesion in the areoposterima, which is indicated by the arrow. This was taken during our first patient's case, an episode of intractable nausea and vomiting. Uh, B shows a T2 of the subsequent myelitis episode that was described in that patient case. And I'm gonna move on uh, to the other, to, to again recap. So uh, transverse myelitis, optic neuritis, areoposterima syndrome. Um, I mentioned the narcolepsy, SIDH, and the hypothalamic presentations, um, and the brainstem syndrome. So again, just kind of trying to be repetitive there because those, um, when we get to the diagnostic criteria, that's what's going to be important to keep in mind. As far as the evaluation and workup of these patients, an MRI with and without contrast, so the brain and spinal cord is going to be necessary. Um, I, I can, you know, um, when I'm thinking about the evaluation, some of it I think there are a lot of times when these NMO cases, especially the ones that I continue to read about, kind of hit you over the head with these patients with a fairly severe myelitis or very se fairly severe optic neuritis. And so I don't think uh, the MRI should come as a surprise. Serum aquaporin 4 IgG antibody and MOG. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about MOG here in a second. Um, but the cell-based assay is the, is the preferred uh, test. CSF is not required for the diagnosis, but in many of these cases where there's a little bit more of a gray area between NMO and multiple sclerosis, this is going to be a helpful um, a helpful uh, test. Um, and then additional autoimmune serology for the reasons I mentioned above because of the comorbidity. So looking for things like lupus, Sjogren, HIV, and then perineoplastic disorders. And perineoplastic disorders is going to be a more important evaluation in patients who might be seronegative um, because there's a significant portion of these patients and um, you know obviously your evaluation would need to would need to be ongoing. 20 to 25 percent of patients with NMO are aquaporin 4 negative uh, and up to a quarter of these seronegative patients also have antibodies for MOG, uh, myelin, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein IgG. Um, and as I mentioned, ongoing workup, including MOG uh, and perineoplastic disorder, should be performed. MOG is a you know a distinct beast, and I won't talk too much about it. But in brief, uh, the presenting symptoms for it can often look, or the presenting features can be different, and often paint a more infectious picture. Um, it can also commonly follow an infection. It it would include things like fever, rhinorrhea, malaise, cough. Um, there are also clinical manifestations that overlap, including optic neuritis or, uh, you know, brainstem demyelinating episodes, but ADEM is another possible presentation for MOG. It can also look like other viral infections, like an acute flaccid myelitis with an enterovirus infection. Again, it's typically more severe than multiple sclerosis, but the recovery tends to be better than seropositive NMO spectrum disorder. Um, interestingly, the optic neuritis in MOG is associated with optic, optic disc edema significantly more than in NMO spectrum disorder or multiple sclerosis. Um, MOG is also typically monophasic. So these are the diagnostic criteria. I tried to avoid um, putting all of this on a slide or two, but I, I couldn't because I, you know, I think it's important to discuss precisely how we nail this down and what it takes to call somebody uh, or to diagnose NMO. And so just briefly focusing on the top diagnostic criteria with aquaporin-4. So each, at least one clinical core, core clinical characteristic, these are listed at the bottom and the ones I've been trying to hammer home that also include a brainstem syndrome, narcolepsy, or a syndrome with NMO typical brain lesions. Um, to diagnose NMO without aquaporin IgG, at least two of the core clinical characteristics are required. Um, 
and then they describe a dissemination in space. Um, and then negative aquaporin for um, or testing unavailable. Um, if patients don't have aquaporin for um, or the aquaporin for status is unknown, these are the other um, additional requirements, um, which is um, a, a, a brain MRI with normal findings or nonspecific white matter uh, lesions, um, uh, optic nerve MRI with T2 hyperintense lesion or T1 gadolinium extend, extending over more than half the optic nerve length, which is interesting because at this point in time, optic nerve involvement is not uh, part of the diagnostic criteria for multiple sclerosis. Um, I'm just drawing a contrast in the, in the diagnosis. So um, briefly covering the differential diagnosis, I've already mentioned a few of these, multiple sclerosis, MOG or MOGAD, MOGAD um, and then spinal cord lesions from lupus, Sjogren, neurobeshit's disease, sarcoid, and then myelopathies should be considered, um, you know, subacute combined degeneration, HIV or HTLV1 are just important additional considerations when the picture is not perfectly clear. So we can move on to treatment now. Um, so it's divided kind of into two categories, attack and then prolonged therapies. So for attack treatment, um, high dose corticosteroids are the mainstay or the first line therapy, um, typically, though not exclusively. Often it's a thousand or a one gram IV methylprednisolone daily for five days. This is first line for an attack, and then some physicians consider a steroid taper, though not all. If the attack is refractory, um, typically patient, I'm sorry, we pursue a plasma exchange, and this is five to seven. Uh, plasma, five to seven exchanges, um, and the data for this is well supported. It, and it also should be considered in patients with incomplete recovery, whether or not there's, and this is the same if you're seropositive or seronegative. I couldn't find, there's a number of trials that examine, uh, you know, both plasma exchange and corticosteroids in combination. And what wasn't abundantly clear is the period of time after which somebody considers um, a, you know, a treatment failure. Um, I think in, in the case that a patient doesn't appear to respond to the, high do, the initial daily, you know, a couple days of high-dose corticosteroids, uh, it would be reasonable to initiate or consider initiating plasma exchange at that time. Um, there, again, are also, it's also not unreasonable to start plasma exchange initially. Um, the um, the, in, the the complete remission induction remission induction rate uh, tends to be a little bit higher in patients treated with plasma exchange for initial or for NMO attacks as first line, um, and then you know irrespective of the first uh, treatment, the an additional round of treatment plasma exchange or steroids tends to increase remission rates further. If a patient previously responded better to plasma exchange, then this is often considered first line for repeat attack. And this is, this is I, I was looking largely at adult literature, as I understand, I think sometimes in children or in the pediatric population, uh, plasma exchange tends to be, or is often the first, uh, first line um, therapy. And then some, again, sometimes it's with or without uh, uh, concurrent ster concomitant steroid use. Um, so as far as attack prevention, um, indefinite therapy is recommended after a single attack. Um, this tends to relapse. And this was historically using medications like mycophenolate, azathioprine, or corticosteroids, or rituximab. And these relapse-free rates uh, vary from 30 to 80 percent. Um, at this point in time, immunosuppressive therapy is recommended to seronegative patients. What that therapy is, is less clear, um, but it is recommended. And I'll talk about the various therapies, the specific disease modifying, I guess there'll be, yeah, those therapies here in a moment. But until um, 2019, it was generally mycophenolate, rituximab, azathioprine. Um, among these, rituximab was the, was the most efficacious. And then there have been some small uncontrolled studies and groups that have uh, performed stem cell transplant. So as far as the targets, I want to break it down into the various targets for attack prevention. 
um, which is uh, targeting B cells or CD20 and CD19, and that would be agents like rituximab or inibilizumab. And then targeting complement, which uh, using eculizumab, uh, which targets C5, and then targeting the IL-6 receptor. So I mentioned interleukin and complement activation as part of the downstream pathology for NMO or aquaporin-4 uh, IgG uh, binding. Um, and that would be with cetralizumab or tocilizumab. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about tocilizumab, which is historically an ar uh, rheumatoid arthritis medication. Uh, it's not really, um, I, I, don't, I don't have an NMO practice, but as far as the literature is concerned, it's not really discussed a lot anymore, or especially, it, it, but I'd be happy to hear feedback on, on, on that one. Um, so uh, we've seen this picture now, but I've included at the bottom or the base of this image, there's kind of the specific targets that we're discussing. So um, these target on the left hand side, you can see the rituximab targeting in the B cell, the pre B cell, uh, pro and pre B cells, uh, as well as immature and mature B memory B cells, uh, CD20, and inibilizumab, which is targeting various stages of B cell development. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the plasma cell and CD19, where CD19 is found. Um, Okay, um, so B cell therapies first. Um, there was a trial called the RIN1 trial, I'm calling it the RIN1 trial, RIN1 trial, and the NMOMentum trial. These were both studying uh, therapies targeted towards B cell, or uh, CD19, CD20. So the RIN1 trial um, was a multicenter, uh, uh, randomized double blind placebo controlled trial. Uh, performed in Japan, where the patients also received oral steroid doses for eight weeks from randomization. In the rituximab patients, um, so the, the study period was 72 weeks long, um, and in these patients, um, there was none of them on rituximab experienced a relapse, um, whereas seven of the placebo group patients uh, had a relapse. Um, this uh, primary endpoint was time to relapse in 72 weeks, which is about 500 days. Um, and unfortunately, the trial was too small to look at like relative risk or risk reduction. Um, another issue that we've run into, and this is, you know, patients uh, who receive rituximab, it's not effective in all, all these patients. And one of the reasons is because CD20 is, or the possible reasons, is CD20 is not expressed on peripheral plasma blasts. And so aquaporin-4 IgG producing cells are not completely depleted. So you still have production of these aquaporin-4, this aquaporin-4 IgG. Um, in contrast, CD19 is expressed on plasma blasts and other B cell subsets. So a target uh, therapy, an agent targeting CD19 uh, offers a little bit more promise in that regard. Um, while plasma cells in, um, in the uh, CSF primarily originate in the periphery, there is also evidence that intrathecal production occurs. Um, and I put the price up on here on all of these. This is going to be increasingly relevant in our next page, um, where the dosing is one gram every two weeks for two doses, or 375 per meter squared weekly for four weeks, and then repeating one gram every six weeks, I'm sorry, six months or earlier. Um, so I wanna talk about the N-momentum trial with inibilizumab, which is a aplizna, um, targeting CD19. Um, this was another multicenter, double-blind, placebo-controlled, phase 2-3 in North America, Europe, Asia. Um, uh, the patients in this trial were aquaporin-4 IgG positive, which is going to be important when we're contrasting these. I'll talk about that in a moment, um, because some of these trials also included patients who were seronegative, which will obviously affect the outcome of these um, agents. Uh, in this case, I'm sorry, in this study, patients received oral prednisone 20 milligrams per day or equivalent on days 1 and 14. Um, at 48 weeks, 88% of the treatment group was relapse-free versus 57% of the placebo. They stopped this study early because of how effective uh, the uh, therapy was felt to be. This is uh, $5,000 per milliliter, uh, where I think these come in, I think it's like 150 or 300 milligrams per milliliter um, 
And so this adds up quickly. I have the total yearly costs here coming up. Um, so uh, the primary endpoint in the study was time to onset of NMO attack on or before day 197. They also looked at EDSS scores, um, which worsened 16% with the drug versus 34% with the placebo. With the drug group, there were also fewer NM new MRI lesions than with placebo and 70% fewer disease-related hospitalizations. Um, so um, of the 100, there were 174 patients that received enabilizumab. Uh, 21 of them, or 12%, experienced an attack, and this is compared to 22 of the 56 that received placebo. So that's 39% of patients that received placebo experienced an attack. Um, the most common adverse effects on this were infusion reactions. Um, and, and as I mentioned, that one of the drawbacks is they weren't really able to make any conclusions about seronegative patients from this study. Um, and the open label phase has shown that inibilizumab treatment can provide sustained reductions um, and delayed disability worsening for at least five years at this point in time. I think that there was data from this that was presented at AN in 2021. Uh, I didn't catch it this year, but I did see the Aplizna booth and they had smoothies. Um, so next I wanna talk about cetralizumab. Uh, which is a monoclonal antibody for IL-6. IL-6 isn't measured necessarily on, uh, on this figure. Um, but the aquaporin-4 IgG production from plasma cells is T-cell dependent, which involves T-helper cells and high levels of IL-6. And I think I've got some T-helper cells on here. Yeah, no, I don't. Okay. Um, so moving on, um, so this is, there were two trials that we'll, I'll talk about real quick, um, Sakura Sky and Sakura Star. These are both phase three uh, double-blind placebo-controlled trials with satralizumab, which is called InSpring, um, to try to get through this page of words. Uh, essentially, there were, in Sky, in Sakura Sky, uh, stable immunosuppressant dose, concomitant use of a stable immunosuppressant was permitted with these patients. Um, so there was cetralizumab versus placebo. Um, eight of the 41 patients had a relapse in the uh, treatment group versus 18 in the placebo group. At 48 and 96 weeks, uh, the about 90% in the treatment group were relapse free uh, and 78% at 96 weeks. It was not effective in seronegative patients uh, in this trial. In the Sakura STAR trial, um, the immunosuppressive therapies were not allowed, so patients could not also be on a different immunosuppressant therapy like rituxan. 30% um, of these patients were acoporin-4 negative, so they were seronegative. Uh, in the cetralizumab group, uh, 19 of the 63 had a relapse versus 16 of the 32 in the placebo. So at at 48 weeks, 76% of the patients receiving cetralizumab um, alone were uh, relapse-free, and at 96 weeks, that value was 72%. Uh, this is $18,000 per milliliter in a 120 milligram per milliliter vial, uh, and the loading dose is uh, 18 grand every two weeks for three doses, um, followed by a maintenance dose of an additional uh, $18,000 every four weeks. So um, as far as the annualized relapse rate, which is an important number, it's 0.12 in the cetralizumab group and 0.32 in the placebo group in the Sakura Sky trial. Um, and, you know, the relapse rates, again, comparing these trials can be a little bit difficult because the relapse rates could be can look a little bit different because the trials, some of them included the seronegative NMO patients and some did not. Um, but let's move on, I don't run out of time. So finally, I wanna talk about eculizumab, which is a complement C5 monoclonal antibody. Um, this was the PREVENT trial, which was a randomized double-blind trial of eculizumab, or what's also called Soliris, of 143 patients at 80 sites in the Americas, Europe, and Asia Pacific. 
The relapse-free rates, I'll just go to 144 weeks, was 96% in the eculizumab group um, and 45% in the placebo, uh, which is uh, very impressive. Um, and at 3.7 years uh, the, after the open label extension, the 94% uh, of patients were free of relapses. And when I say adjudicated relapses, these are relapses evaluated by uh, as evaluated by neurologists, which typically mean like worsening uh, or like a significant event, worsening disability or objective neuro neurology, objective finding on neurologic exam. Um, interestingly, the change in the disability score in the eculizumab group did not differ significantly from that in the placebo group. And so you can't really, there were a number of other secondary endpoints uh, that were, weren't able to be evaluated. As far as the safety, a huge number of uh, page 92% of the patients in the eculizumab treated group, um, but also 91% in the placebo treated group reported these events. They were serious in only 15 or 16% uh, of these patients. Um, but I'll, I'll move on to talk about the safety. So here's just the comparison um, of the five different trials. So the blue is our eculizumab, and what you're looking at on the y axis is the percentage of patients without a relapse and on the x-axis, um, and this is where you have to be especially mindful on the x-axis is the number of weeks until relapse. Um, and so this varies across these five studies where uh, in the eculizumab trial it was up to 220, uh, along with also the cetralizumab, and the, um, but the rituximab trial was only 70 weeks. Um, that I'm discussing, and the enabilizumab was about 29 weeks. Um, but you can see essentially what a kind of graphical form of what we were talking about. Um, the, diff the, the trial designs were different enough. We, you know, we don't have head-to-head -head trials of eculizumab versus atrilizumab at this point in time. Um, and, you know, the other reason this is difficult to compare these is the proportions of patients who are aquaporin-4 seronegative. Uh, was included also varied. Um, there weren't some. There weren't necessarily controls for pre-enrollment relapse rates, and then the duration and the disability at baseline was was uh, difficult to compare as well. Um, there and as I mentioned before, there's no agent currently approved approved for seronegative NMO spectrum disorder. So when we're considering therapy, um, we want to think about stability of disease. If a patient is on rituximab and they're not having a relapse, they don't need to pay three quarters of a million dollars a year, or do they need to pay three quarters of a million dollars a year for eculizumab, or does someone need to pay that cost? So changing therapies on somebody on a stable agent, uh, you know, is a discussion that needs to be had. Um, cost, I, I keep kind of hammering home because it's fairly staggering. And while the companies tend to offer patient assistance, I don't, I, I, th I don't think these are without their costs either. Because what typically happens is, um, what I've, uh, uh, what tends to happen with these patients is um, the the patient assistance programs require medical staff or staff from the clinic itself or the patient themselves to spend a, a tremendous amount of time uh, trying to acquire some of these medications. And while, you know, being relapse-free is very important, I just think it's an, uh, an additional consideration. Uh, monotherapy versus concomitant therapy. Uh, in the PREVENT trial, for example, the attack-free trial, I'm sorry, the attack-free patients with eculizumab was as high with the concomitant therapy as those with monotherapy. And so whether or not these therapies or any given therapies should be combined is unclear at this point in time. All of the medications, as far as the safety profile, all of the medications had favorable safety profiles. Um, but, you know, depleting immunoglobulins increases people's long-term risk of infection and hospitalization. Um, so that's, those are just some of my treatment considerations. Um, and that's my discussion of NMO. I wanted to leave some time for questions. Um, and apparently my audio is not working so well. So I'll, uh, I can see the chat and I'll try to address questions we have. I see Dr. Friedland had a question for the first case. I assume she was negative for herpes and other viruses. Uh, so that wasn't my patient, but yes, I, I'm going to think so. That was one of the patients from the continuum. So I, I can't confirm that 100%. Um, 
And then as far as the cause of NMO itself, um, you know, I, my only, uh, I don't have a, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, I, 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 I don't, um, I see. Okay. Uh, just an anti-NMO antibody is the mechanism, not the cause. I, I don't know necessarily what, uh, what is the source of the antibody. I don't have, um, I, an answer for that. This, this is very point. frustrating, not being able to ask a question to the speaker. But I'm writing, I'll write it down. I'm going to log on to another BlueJeans instance and see if I can actually hear you. Dr. Freeland? Hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, thank you. With, with, with Ru Lanlu in the neurology department and the colleagues in Israel, we reported in 2013 that there is uh, evolutionary conservation of protein structure. That is, that if evolution has produced a protein structure that's valuable in one species, it may be conserved in others. And that's often the case so that many proteins that are used in humans are also used in uh, all mammals and even reptiles and sometimes um, microorganisms. So we ask the question, why do people get anti-animal anti antibodies? So if you do a BLAST search, you can look at all the protein homologies or similarities. You pick a protein like NMO, and then you do a BLAST search using the National Library of Medicine database. We found that aquaporin in humans, in astrocytes, in the brain, has a similarity to aquaporins in plants. And uh, the idea here is that water channels are important for, for the brain, but they're also important in plants. It's really quite remarkable. If you have like a house plant and you don't water it for two weeks, uh, many of them, some of them would die, but m many of them would be, would be pretty fine. They might be a little bit droopy, but they, have, they must have aquaporins to manage their water balance. So the idea is that uh, antibodies could be uh, caused by a allergy to proteins like aquaporins found in plants. And this is uh, particularly higher in uh, soybeans and spinach. And we, we published this in 2013 and has been cited by um, nine, only nine other studies. But the I think the basic, um, and it could be important because there might be a dietary treatment and it might be that uh, relapses are caused by exposure to aquaporins in the diet, particularly aquaporins that might be present in plants. And um, I find it's a, it's a general issue in neurology that neurologists tend to be concerned with diagnosis and treatment and pathophysiology, but they haven't uh, often the cause is not considered. And Alzheimer's disease may be the best example of that, where there's literally 10,000 papers on amyloid beta protein. But the amyloid cascade hypothesis does not explain what is the cause of Alzheimer's disease. And that's obviously uh, another discussion. But uh, the, a similar thing is true about uh, myasthenia. So, in myasthenia, there are uh, anticholinergic antibodies, antibodies to the neuromuscular junction, which are um, 
pathogenic. But the question is, why do people get these antibodies? And uh, we have published some some papers about that as well. And it's a it's generally a good question to ask to go beyond uh, diagnosis, treatment, and pathophysiology, and consider uh, etiology. And um, it is the our most important environmental exposure is to bacteria that are present in the gut, and also to diet. And uh, thank you for your excellent talk. Thank you. I appreciate the the, the question, and the, I remember you mentioning the aquaporin four channel. Uh, I, I regret not remembering it when I was preparing the talk, but as you mentioned, I do remember you you talking about the the similarity with the plant protein, and it raises some raises some really good questions. Interestingly, and and when you mentioned that we're interested in the mechanism and the pathophysiology. Uh, I looked at a lot of papers um, to uh, try to understand NMO better, and I don't recall a single one <laughs> explicitly mentioning at what point or how this specifically, uh, why, you know, this specific etiology, I mean, this etiology or an etiology. It's not, you know, when people discuss the disruption of the blood brain barrier. And what aquaporin for itself does, uh, where it is, um, but not necessarily the initiating um, event or insult, um, which is a it's a really good question. I can actually hear now. So if anybody else has any questions, feel free. Uh, the, the truth is that you do not have to have a PhD in immunology to do a BLAST search. Anybody can go to the National Library of Medicine and do it. And there are, uh, I imagine, librarians in our Kornhauser Library who can help you, or the National Library of Medicine can help you themselves. Because this question can be asked for uh, anti-MOG and for any autoimmune neurological disease. That is, why do people get these antibodies? The, uh, the other explanation is that it's just a mistake. Uh, too bad, we're sorry, but your immune system has decided to attack itself. And I think that's not a very satisfactory explanation. No. The other explanation I like is that it's caused by molecular mimicry, that there are similar molecular patterns through evolutionarily conserved protein structures so that um, antibody, antibodies or an immune response to one thing causes a disease because of this similarity. The best example there is rheumatic heart disease. So streptococcus in the throat has an antigen which causes an immune response, which because of this similarity of the proteins in the heart and the bacteria it causes a uh, antibody response which attacks the heart valve. And this is what's called uh, molecular mimicry, which is a very important concept that could be uh, responsible for many neurological autoimmune conditions. Okay, thank you, Randy. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.